there a moment ago, the Lord changed my message. But the song goes good with anything. I'm glad I know a man who can. Who can what? Can meet every need that I have and every need that you have and can do anything that he wants to do. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Hope you'll come back tonight. Uh, You'll enjoy the Golden Valley Crusaders. They're from Golden Valley. Now, if you don't know where Golden Valley is, it's probably not even on the GPS system. But it's above Forest City. Uh, Back in that area, uh, they call it Golden Valley. I don't know where it got its name. I don't know how it got its name. But anyway, these folks will be here tonight. So I hope that you'll come and be with us in the song service. It's been quite a while since we've had just a regular song service. So you'll enjoy their singing, okay? So please come on back tonight. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. That's the only way you're ever going to ever come the devil. That him that's spoken of there is the devil. Uh, When you go home today or tonight or whenever you get a chance, read chapter 11. Uh, I mean chapter 12 in... uh, the book of Revelation and it tells you about some things that's going to take place uh, in this old world one of these days. And uh, it talks about a specific people uh, that is there and how they overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb. But it goes on to say, and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. A couple of years ago, I guess it's been a friend of mine and his wife took a bus tour, one of those Christian bus tours uh, up toward uh, Jamestown, Virginia, back in those uh, areas, the historical places around uh, Richmond and Williamsburg and all of that. They said that the bus was absolutely crowded. Every seat on the bus was taken. When they stopped at a rest area, uh, it was pushing and shoving and seeing who could get off the bus first and get in line first and all of that. When they stopped at a place to eat, it was the same thing. So after a long tour day one day, Everybody was tired and uh, got back on the bus and uh, going back to the place where they were staying, the tour host said, how many would like to stop at a Dairy Queen right down the road? Of course, everybody on the bus wanted to stop. What they didn't know was the tour guide had uh, come up with a real good idea that would stop all of the shoving and pushing and trying to get off first, you know, and all of that. If you stop at a Dairy Queen, it's a good thing to be first in line, especially with a whole bus load. Or you're going to be there for a long time. She had bought a little stuffed lamb And she had said ahead of time before they stopped, whichever side I put this little stuffed lamb on up here at the front of the bus, that's the side that gets off first. And she rotated between stops, that little stuffed lamb. When they came to the Dairy Queen, it was on my friend and his wife's side. They get off first. And in getting off the bus, he heard somebody say, 
I'm glad the lamb was on my side. When I was told that, I said there got to be a message in that. Got to be a message in that. I'm glad to be able to say that the lamb is on my side. And I'm glad to be able to say that not only that, I'm on the Lamb's side. He and I get along pretty good together. And I trust that it's the same in your relationship. But I don't believe that was the first time that phrase was ever used. I got to thinking about some situations in the Bible that I believe folks could have said I'm glad the lamb is on my side. Daniel chapter 3 tells about one situation. King Nebuchadnezzar, the powerful man that he was, owned all of the world that a person could possibly see at that particular time. He got so big and so powerful that he thought he was above God. His wise men and those that had surrounded him, his counselors, as we would say, told him instead of people worshiping other gods, they ought to worship you. So they made an image of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 3 made him out of solid gold and moved him out in the plains of Dura. And he got him together a little hillbilly band and said, whenever the music plays, everybody bows and worships that image. And everybody did, except three Hebrew boys. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow. Well, everybody else was paying homage to that, that image that was set up out there, pure gold. 90 foot high and 9 foot wide was the measurements of that image that they moved out there. But those three boys, friends of Daniel, refused to bow and refused to worship that idol God. When somebody told the king, he'd done something very unusual. He kind of, the king liked Daniel and he kind of liked these three Hebrew boys. And he went to them and said, fellas, why aren't you bowing? I can hear them say, king, we don't have to give this a second thought. We don't have to take a vote on it. We've already made up our our minds. We're not going to bow because he's not the right kind of God. We worship the God of heaven, not an idol God, and not a God made out of gold. Nebuchadnezzar did something that he hardly ever did. Gave him a second chance. Aren't you glad God gave you a second chance and gave me a second chance? And he said, fellas, there's a furnace over there and we'll heat that thing seven times hotter than it's ever been. That's going to be the end of you if you don't bow. I can see those boys say, King, we're not going to bow. Don't care about your furnace. Don't care about your idol God. We're just not going to bow. And I can hear Nebuchadnezzar say, why? They said, well, there's basically three reasons we're not going to bow. Number one, your God is not the right kind of God. Your God can be melted. How did they make the God to start with? They melted the gold and made an image. Any God that's been melted before can be melted again. And they said, we're not going to worship your God. He's not the right kind of God. He can be melted. I'm glad that I have a God today that's not melted, not worried. He's not fretting. He's not wringing his hands. He's not worried about anything. He's the true God and nothing's going to melt him. Everybody's worried today about politics. I got one word that describes politics. Fooey. 
Now, if you don't know what that word means, look it up in the dictionary. You'll find it there. God's not worried about who's going to be and who's not going to be president. God's not worried about the economy. God's not worried about the state of our nation. Our God cannot be melted. He already knows the outcome before it ever begins. Our God is not going to be melted. I can hear him say, secondly, we're not going to bow to your God because your God can be measured. You ever wonder why God specifically put in the Bible the measurements of that idol God out there? Now, in that day and time, a cubic was 18 inches. Multiply what it says in verse 1 by 18 inches, and you come up with a statue 90 foot tall and 9 foot wide. He could be measured. Aren't you glad we have a God that can't be measured? Listen to this. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 12 tells us that he has the waters of this world in the hollow of his hand. And with a span, he meted out the heavens. A span is a distance with your hands spread wide from the distance from the thumb to the tip of the little finger. And that's how God looks at the heavens by the span of his hand. Now listen, that's a big hand. And that big hand's connected to a big arm that's connected to a big body that's connected to a big God. I'm telling you, there's no God like our God. He can't be measured. Then I hear him say there's a third reason we're not going to bow. Your God can be moved. The Bible specifically says they moved him to the plains of Dura. Now come to find out when some town or village began to have an insurrection against Nebuchadnezzar, they'd moved that image to that town or that village, make the people bow and break their will. That God can be moved from place to place. I serve a God that can't be moved. Can't be moved by anything. Everybody in the world is worried about ISIS. I'm concerned about ISIS. I'll be glad when they're wiped out the very last one of them. You say, well, preacher, that's horrible. No, it's not. Amen. Read your Bible. But anyway... I'll be glad when they're gone. Our God's not moved by all of that. He's still in control. Would you believe our God's not sitting up there sweating and wringing his hands and wondering what to do? No, sir, our God can't be moved. He's a steady God. Amen. Well, I can hear those boys as they're tossed into the furnace. The king did something else the kings never did. When they pronounced an execution, the king usually went back to his palace, forgot about all the proceedings. But he hung around for some reason. And when he looked into the furnace to see what happened to those three Hebrew boys, he saw they wasn't bound and they was all walking around in the furnace. But he didn't see just three. I don't know how much he knew about God. But I do know he said the form of the fourth is like unto the Son of God. Those boys came out of that furnace. The Bible says not a hair was singed, not even the smell of smoke on their clothes. And I can hear them say, I'm glad the lamb was on my side. Listen to me. I believe that when the hour of persecution comes, you'll be glad to have the lamb on your side. 1 Samuel chapter 17. I see a teenage boy facing a huge giant by the name of Goliath. That teenage boy, 
as best I can find out, had never been in a fight with another human. Oh, he fought a bear and he fought a lion. That's as worse, I guess, than facing a human. But he had never been on the battlefield. There he stood against a champion, a champion that had been through many a battle and never lost a single battle. Well, all of that was about to change. There stood David. And there stood the giant. I got to thinking one day about that giant. I saw in him some things that I see in some Christians. Now I know that Goliath is a picture of an unsaved person. I know that. But I saw some characteristics in him that I see in a lot of Christians. Number one, he underestimated his enemy. All he saw was a little ruddy fella, a shepherd boy, standing there with a staff in his hand and a sling and a pouch by his side. That's all he saw. If he'd have been any kind of a Christian at all, he'd have saw beyond him and saw angels standing around David and saw a God that was beside him bigger than Goliath was. But all he saw was that little fella. As a matter of fact, he made fun of him and laughed at him and said, I'll feed you to the birds uh, of the air and the beasts of the field. Hmm. He stood there underestimating his enemy. You better not do that. You have an enemy called the devil. You have an enemy called Satan. You underestimate him and you already half lost the battle. Amen. Don't underestimate what the devil can do. All the time, I hear of folks who were in church serving God and suddenly they're out of church and gone. They underestimated the power of the devil. I had a good, good friend pastoring in Gastonia, North Carolina. Church running over a thousand in attendance every Sunday. He got to hurting one day, went to the doctor, and the doctor prescribed some strong pain pills. Well, he started taking those took all that the doctor gave him, went back, the doctor gave him more. Make a long story short, he got hooked on painkillers. The doctor said later that a person can get so hooked on painkillers that they think they're hurting when they're not hurting. So they just popped the pills. It not only affected his home life, it affected his church. And he later admitted that sometimes he had gone to the pulpit not even realizing where he was at or what he was saying. Well, it began to tell. The church officials faced him with it. He agreed to go to rehab. They agreed to help him all they could, so he went to rehab, got off of those things, the church went back to normal for a couple of months and he's right back on the pain pills. It almost cost him his marriage. It did cost him his church and a lot of his friends. He's gone from the area Nobody knows where these still hooked or not. I'm here to tell you the devil will do everything he can to get to you. Don't underestimate the power of the devil. I've heard mom and dad say, my kids will never do what those kids are doing. Don't you ever make that statement. 
crow is hard to eat and hard to swallow and hard to digest. You don't know what your kids are going to turn out and how they're going. Best you can do is teach them about the Lord and pray hard for them. Trust God, amen? Don't underestimate the power of the devil. Secondly, I missed this for a long time. Goliath had an unprotected mind. Covered in armor from the head to the feet except for one place, the forehead. You know what's behind the forehead, don't you? Your brain, your mind. And that was unprotected. I've heard folks say, well, I can't understand the Bible. No, they may not. But they got hours to go down to the uh, CD store and root through them old old movies for hours at a time. Uh Uh-oh. Amen. Our mind needs to be protected. Y'all with me or are you just half asleep? David threw the rock. God guided it to the only unprotected place on the giant, his forehead. If you go to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 49, it says that the giant fell on his face. If you get hit in the forehead, what direction are you going to fall in? I've been hit there. I've been hit a little lower than there too. And I didn't fall forward. I fell backwards. And I couldn't understand that for a long time. But I think I got it figured out. About the time that stone touched the skin of Goliath's forehead, God reached down his great big old hand and slapped him in the back of the head and down he went. Amen. But he had an unprotected mind. He also was standing on unlevel ground. If you'll read the story, David was on one side of the mountain and Goliath was on the other side of the mountain. And I know a little bit about mountains. You can't stand on a mountain level, you're unlevel. Amen? I'm a hillbilly boy, I know that for sure. I was reminded again this week, up in the mountains of Virginia, they got little trails around the mountain. All the way do they do that in West, yeah, West Virginia? All the way around. I told somebody that they have that because the cow's legs are shorter on one side than they are on the other and they just have to walk around and around. But they got them little trails. You can't stand on the side of a mountain on level ground. Can I tell you, you can't serve God with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. You better get on level ground. And the ground is level around Calvary. One more and I'll quit. I believe that David walked off of that battlefield that day with Goliath's sword in one hand, Goliath's head in the other, saying, I'm glad the lamb was on my side. I've been to Calvary. No. Not physically. I have been to the place where traditionally they say in the Holy Land that that's the place where Jesus was crucified. I'm not sure nobody else knows if that's the real place. And that's not the place I'm talking about. I've been to that place called the spiritual Calvary where I bowed at the old rugged cross and accepted Jesus as my Savior. My sins were washed away. My name written in the Lamb's book of life. And as I look back across the years from that place where I was saved, I can stand and say, thank God, I'm glad the Lamb is on my side. And I hope you can say that too. The Lamb will have to be on your side before you ever go to heaven. Let's stand across the building.